Today, in part three, then, what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the fear of failure. The fear of failure. Now, our freaking out affected control and friends, community. Today, we're going to talk about core value. Not core values, but about your intrinsic core value as a human being. Now, when you see the word failure, I mean, many of us even hearing the word failure, all sorts of emotions come to mind. But here's the truth about failure. Failure is like, like many things, a spectrum. I mean, you can, you can fail badly in just putting too much salt in a meal, or you can fail badly at an exam or fail badly, you know, let's say in a relationship. And, and you know, obviously one is worse than the other, but we all know as human beings what it is to fail. And the truth is failure is oftentimes devastating. In fact, many of us in the room, many watching online right now, many of us here today, connected and engaged, many of us are still living out choices or consequences or living in the rebound effect of a failure, whether it was our failure or someone who failed us and had devastating consequences. See, failure is a very powerful thing because failure has the power not only to affect us, but actually to shape us, to shape our identity, to shape our confidence, to shape our future. Failure has real-time causes. We know what it's like to be in failure, to be failing, to go through failure, but failure can also have lifetime consequences. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on in the message. Here's some just general stats about failure, as we're trying to do every week in this message, just get a grip of what's happening out there in our culture. Nearly 50% of adults admit to having a fear of failure. Now, I, I think that's higher, but in this survey, 50% or more, or sorry, 50%, just under 50%, admitted to having a specific, not just fear, but a fear of failure in particular. That means just under half of this room and half of you watching online are, 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 are in a place where you're, you're afraid of failing, whether it's at marriage, whether it's with a business, whether it's a school, whether it's in music, whether it's in life. You just have this fear of failure. One in three people struggle with fear of failure. So again, a third of this room right now, right now in this very moment or online are struggling with a fear of failure. And shockingly, believe it or not, we're told that, that this fear of failure can start as early as five to six years old. As kids are getting into school and building you know, relationships outside the home for the first time and getting a little bit of independence, that's where this fear of failure can begin to take a grip of our lives. And if we don't have solutions, if we can't find help, if we don't find an answer, this fear of failure can paralyze us for the rest of our lives. Now, as we talk about failure, let's break it down. What what do we mean by failure? Well, in the English dictionary, the word failure is defined as uh, not meeting a desirable or attended objective, which results in one not feeling successful. This is very important, right? Because there is this sense, especially in our day and age, especially in the Western world, where we, we desire to be successful, right? None of us get into something without hoping or wanting or working towards its success, I mean, we, we, just, we just don't do that. That would be a waste of time. Very often when people ask us for our time, hey, you want to come see this or come do this? Or maybe you're here and you've never been in a church before, watching online, you're thinking, I'll go check it out, but I don't want it to be a waste of my time. So we're always kind of trying to power up things in our mind according to how successful it will be for us. But what happens in a success-driven culture when you can't be successful? When you don't experience success, when you're told you're not successful, when you look around and everybody else seems to be succeeding, but you seem to be failing. See, in our culture, cultural kind of vernacular, uh, failure is not making the mark. Failure is this idea. There's a standard out there. There's a standard when it comes to your natural beauty, okay? And if you don't, if you don't cut cheese on Instagram or TikTok, you're not going to make it in life. And, 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 when, and then we laugh at it, but it's actually quite sad because so many people feel like they have to doctor up their own image to show the world a better version of themselves. Why? Because the real version of themselves does not meet the mark. Now listen carefully, especially if you're a young woman. If the person who eventually you find up, you find and end up marrying, marries you because of what they saw on Instagram. Instagram cannot sustain your marriage. You can't live your life with an airbrushed version of your reality. You are who you are. As we're going to see, you're made where you are on purpose and you are beautiful in God's eyes. But our culture 
has created this thing of where if you don't meet the mark, whatever the mark is, maybe it's a grade in your leaving cert, the amount of points you get, maybe it's the income you have, maybe it's where you live in the Dublin area, what number comes after Dublin, you know what I'm saying? Maybe it's all these things. There's a mark out there and we don't meet that mark. We feel like a failure. Failure is not having also what it takes. Fear is this idea that I'm not going to even try. I'm not even going to attempt. I'm not even going to take the risk because if I don't have what it takes... What does that mean for me, for my future, for my, my sense of self-worth, for my identity? And culture also defines fa- failure as not being good enough. You're just not good enough to fit in this gang. You're not, fo- you're not good enough to belong to this club. You're not good enough to be my friend. You're not good enough to go to that school. You're not good enough to get into that company. You're just not good enough. Now, when you see these cultural kind of definitions of failure, you can see why, you know, right now a lot of people might be struggling with this. Maybe many of you in the room, maybe you watch it online, because we're constantly wondering, will I meet the mark? Will I be good enough? We're constantly wrestling these tensions, what we see portrayed, because here's the, and and I'm not against social media, so don't get me wrong, but one of the problems that social media presents us with, there's many benefits, there's many problems, but one of the problems is, is people only post the best version of themselves on their best day, doing their best things, right? And not only do that, but then they, before they post it, they take the photo or take the video, and then they go and they, they use filters and they edit to make the best version of themselves even better. And we're sitting at home, sick with a flu, eating ice cream, you know, feeling snotty, looking at that going, I hate my life. I have this thing where, where God has blessed me and my family. We get to do some cool things, get to go see some cool places. But I rarely ever post on Instagram only just exciting things. I want to talk about my family. I want to talk about my church. I want to talk about what's real, what's really me. I can post some, I, I can meet some amazing, and I've met some amazing people, class A stars. I never post on Instagram. So I have no need to feel like people will think of me better just because of where I am and who I'm with and what I'm doing because my identity is not rooted in what my followers on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or whatever think of me. Amen. Come on, amen. Yes, we're celebrating. And that doesn't make me great. That's just a decision I make and you can make it too. See, our culture all the time, see, see we live in a day and age like never before. Why? Because think about it. Because of social media, when you fail, your fail is public. Everyone knows about it because it's on social media. Now, it's so interesting because when you think about failure, there's this, there's this wonderful question I love asking. It's the what if question. And what if is a powerful question, but it's powerful in two ways. If you're someone who leads towards the optimist side of the spectrum, what if can lead you to amazing adventures and innovations and opportunities? But if you lead towards the pessimism side of the spectrum, what if leads you down a road of, if it doesn't work, if it goes wrong, if I don't have enough money, if there's enough people, if I ain't good enough, if I don't make the mark, and we actually can talk ourselves out of life. Not just opportunity, we can talk ourselves out of life because we're so pessimistic. And here's the thing, very often the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is the fact that optimists, think about the word optical, the optimist can see something, the pessimist cannot Now the truth is this, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic in this room, you're still the same. You're a human being with your limitations, with your story, with your background, with your scars. We're all the same. We're all ordinary people online in this place. But the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is the optimist sees something beyond themselves that enables them, gives them courage to take the risk anyway. And one of my goals for you today is that when we walk out of this room, when our time is done, that we would ask the what if question in an opportunistic sense. In a sense that, you know, maybe there's a God out there who loves me, who's got a plan for my life, has got a purpose for me. What if I obey him? What if I follow him? What if I give him my life? What if, if you're watching or here in the room and you're skeptical, what if he is real? What if he is who he said he is? What if Jesus Christ did in fact rise from the dead? What if? You see, in our culture, there's this battle between success and significance. Because we idolize wealth and we idolize fame and we idolize popularity, we think to be su- successful gives us significance. When actual fact I want you to see today is that by being significant, you are a success. See, if our success is something we grab from the outside and pull it in, it won't last. 
But if our success comes from this internal place of significance that we know who we are and we know whose we are and we have a sense of where we're going, then no matter what we do, no matter what happens to us, no matter where we go, we can experience success. See, our culture defines success as what you do. Is that the first thing we do when we meet people? We meet someone, we go, what do you do? And immediately we're, we're just sizing them up. Are they better? Are they worse? Are they more? Are they, you know, we're just trying to figure out where they fit in the system. And oftentimes we make little judgments, even sometimes subconscious judgments, about another human being because of what they do. This question is the bane of my life. People ask me, what do you do? How, where do I even begin to? I mean, I'm a pastor. Well, of course, you, if you come from a nation, if you're watching from a nation that has churches like this and pastors, oh, no problem, you have a box for that. But if you're like me, grew up in Ireland, grew up in a different religion, never really experienced Christian church, don't really get it, and you tell someone you're a pastor. I mean, most times people go to me, are you a plasterer? Yeah. I'm going, well, I wish I was. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm like, a, I'm like a, a minister, right? Oh, like, like a minister for the state. No, 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 not a political minister. I'm like a minister of like the church. Also, like you're a priest. Well, I'm kind of married, huh? Like, it's very sticky for me. Every single time someone asks me this question, what do you do? I just sigh and say, Lord, give me wisdom. Because beyond me trying to clarify what I do, I, I'm totally tuned into the fact that they are going to make a decision about my value, my worth, and my significance based on how I answer that question. And come on, let's be honest, when you're online and watching the room, one of the things that we hate as human beings is being misunderstood. You know, it's just bothering people misunderstand you. Or, or, or people claim you said something you didn't say. It just really bothers us. And so when you try to explain what you do and they don't get it, and they're judging you for it, it's like, oh my gosh, how fair is this? That's why, let me tell you something, I cling to that scripture where Jesus said, blessed are you who are persecuted on my behalf, you know, because it's like, man, I work hard. Okay, so success, our culture defines success by, by what we do. But God, this is really interesting. We're going to kind of bring it down now to God's word in a second. But God defines success differently. God defines success by who we are. You see, when we get who we are right, what we do lines up. But if we try to figure out who we are through what we do, we get lost and messed up. This is where the comparison trap comes in. We're always comparing ourselves. Now, comparison as a whole isn't bad. There's times where it's good to compare things, right? I mean, if you want to go buy something, just a couple weeks ago I was here, I wanted to buy a suit, I went to one shop, I looked at what was available, I got some prices, I went to another shop, I, you know, talked to prices, I negotiated, got the price down, because comparison sometimes can be a useful tool, right? But when we're trying to compare our worth to another human being's worth, based off our culture's definition of success, meaning if you have more money and more houses and more toys and more followers and more fame, therefore you are worth more. Even the idea of someone's net worth is disgusting. Because even an orphan child in Africa who was abandoned by their parents and fighting off starvation is still as valuable as the richest person in Hollywood. As valuable as the greatest mind, greatest musician, greatest actor, greatest inventor, greatest philanthropist. Because in God's eyes, we have equal value. Regardless of skin color, ethnicity, religious background, disability, no matter what it is, we have equal value. Comparison is not helpful. Comparison is not wise. Because it attacks the very core of our being. It attacks our value. And wherever societies, historically speaking, were successful in dividing people into, into differential categories of value, what usually follows short after, shortly after is atrocity. Because you can only logically and rationally uh, accept the destruction of other beings if you believe they're less valuable than you. The Christian gospel is revolutionary long before its time. Because the Christian gospel teaches us that we all have value. So the question we ask ourselves today is very simple. What help do we have then when we have a fear of failure, what does God's word say to us to help us overcome this overwhelming sense of cultural failure? Well, to break it down, there's, there's some things we need to know and there's some things we need to do. Some things we need to know and some things we need to do. So first of all, four things we need to know. Come on, TV. There we go. Four things we need to know. Number one, put up there for me. That's not it. And again, there we go. 
First thing we need to know, we need to remember everybody fails. Hey, imagine that. Every single person in this room online in the world, everyone fails. The, the failure rate in humanity is still 100%. And no one can avoid that. And so many of us, because we've been hurt by this in the past, we try to live our lives avoiding failure at all costs, believing that we can be perfect. We have a perfect marriage, a perfect business model, a perfect song, a perfect team, a perfect record. We have a perfect emotional intelligence. And the truth is, that does not last because it's not real. And when our perfect anything begins to become imperfect because we're imperfect, all of a sudden our worldview falls apart and we end up finding ourselves depressed. Because we, we have to remember that every single person fails. In the book of James, chapter 3, verse 2, and today we're going to look at a lot of scripture, so uh, track along. And again, all the notes are in the uh, Bible app, a U version. <clears throat> but James said, we all stumble, and we all stumble <clears throat> in many ways. Yeah. We all stumble, and we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who never has a fault, what to say, is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check, but we are not perfect, right? Ecclesiastes 7.20 said, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Okay, so James makes the point that, just generally speaking, we all stumble, and we all stumble in many ways. But the author of Ecclesiastes, who is King Solomon, he brings a step further and says that this isn't just a, 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 a you know, what do you call it, a practical thing. This is a spiritual thing, right? Because there's a sense in where there's, there's, there's this thing called righteousness, which I'm going to break down in a second. And there's no one on earth who is intrinsically righteous. There's no one on earth who has never sinned. We've all sinned. What sin? Sin is when we violate the, the standard procedure, God's expectations, God's law for the world. All of us have sinned, and therefore we're not righteous. And the more unrighteous we become, the more we fall and stumble. And in fact, if you want to get into it in a detailed way, what happens over time is the unrighteousness of our world becomes our nature to the, fact, to the point where we begin to act out its persona. We accept and we simply uh, uh, excuse our sinful ways, because you know what? I'm not perfect. Yeah, I know I should have been faithful to you in this marriage, but you know what? I'm not perfect. Yeah, I know I should have paid you back when I told you I would, but you know what? I'm not perfect. You know, I said I would, but I didn't because I'm not perfect. And what that causes is a circular experience of hurt, pain, and betrayal, which goes back to last week's message. See, Solomon says no one is righteous, and there's not a single person that never sins. So, so what can we do? Where's the help? Where's the hope? Well, this is why we need a gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. And the gospel message is this. Jesus, who was perfect. Jesus, who is righteous. Jesus, who never sinned, came in our place and paid the price for our lack of righteousness. So in exchange, we can experience that gift. And he took on our sin. Righteousness is the, is the idea that we can stand before God innocently purely we're hiding anything because jesus paid the price for our sin yeah and if you're a believer that is worth celebrating today the gospel is what we call this great exchange so now we can approach god's throne it says in hebrews with boldness and confidence not with fear and trepidation because we will not be rejected and we won't be rejected because the thing that separates from god our sinful ways has been paid for by jesus christ's blood shed on the cross let's remember Everyone needs Jesus because everyone fails. Number two, remember, failure is not final. That's for someone right now. I'll say it again. Failure is not final. What's another way of saying that? Failure is not forever. Some of you are still living in failure. You're still living in it. You're still wrestling with the, that business idea that never got off the ground, that relationship that didn't work. You know, you're still living in the past. I'm here to tell you failure is not forever. The gospel isn't just a good news for in terms of a salvation thing. The gospel it makes us new every single day. It's good news because every single day that we turn our heart and affection and our mind towards God, the, God, the gospel renews us. It gives us a, a new chance, a new opportunity, a new day to do new things. It's why in Psalm chapter 40, verse 1 to 4, the author says this, when he was struggling, when he was failing, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord in my failure. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit. Out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a rock 
and gave me a firm place down. What a great metaphor for failure. Verse 3, he put a new song. Come on, say with me. One, two, three. New song. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is, one, is the one who trusts in the Lord. The author is saying that when I was stuck, when I was down, when I was in a, in a hole of my own making, you all know the expression, you keep digging the hole, right? You say something stupid, right? You realize it, rather than shutting up, you keep saying stupid things, and all of a sudden the hole gets deeper, and all of a sudden you realize, I can't get out of this thing. I need to be rescued. Well, the gospel is that God rescues us from our failure. Failure is not final. Failure is not forever. There's a new day, a new season, a new opportunity. Because of this, we can sing a new song. And when people see what God has done in our lives, this word fear is, is actually the word reverence. When people see what God has done in our lives, they will have a reverence for him. Like, wow, God really helped you. God really saved you. God really did a miracle in your life. Therefore, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Maybe you failed. Maybe someone's failed you. Remember, failure is not final. Failure is not forever. God will take you out of the pit and he'll give you a new song. Number three, remember, failure can make you stronger. I know we feel like failure comes about because we're weak. Oh, if only I was stronger when it happened, I wouldn't have failed, right? And that sometimes is true. However, what's almost always guaranteed, depending on our reaction to our failure, is that our failure can make us stronger. You see, failure is not giving up. Failure is not getting up. I said again, failure is not giving up only. Failure is not getting up. We all fall. You know, I don't know what kind of upbringing you have, but I played a sport called rugby. And if you don't get used to having your face in the ground, you're not going to be good at rugby. Because a lot of the game you spent in the ground with loads of people on top of you. Rugby, one definition could be, is rugby is the sport of constantly getting back up again. Of saying, I got to go again. There's more to be done. It isn't over yet. We're going to push. We're going to work together. Failure is when you get hit and you're on the ground and you say, I don't want to get up anymore. It's not worth getting up anymore. I can't fight for my marriage. I can't fight for this dream. I can't fight for my Christian faith and work. I can't fight for what I believe in for my friends. I, I, just, I just don't want to get up anymore. All of a sudden, this slimy pit seems attractive because there's a sense in where, you know, the, the, the evil that we know is better than the evil that we don't know. But the minute that we say, Man, I failed. Man, I screwed up. Man, you know, I, I really wish I hadn't done that, but I'm, I'm determined to get back up again. All of a sudden, by definition, that isn't failure. Failure is staying down. Here's what our faith does. Faith helps us to get up. There are so many instances in Scripture. I couldn't go through them all today because it would be a 20-week series, okay? So many instances, instances in Scripture where basically the story goes like this. A man or a woman is trying to serve God. They fail, they fall down. God comes and says, get back up again. Get back up again. Hey, hey, Elijah, get back up again. Hey, Moses, get back up again. Hey, Joshua, get back up again. Hey, David, get back up again. Hey, Peter, get back up again. Hey, Paul, get up. I mean, the Bible in one sense is basically people falling down and God intervening in their story, showing them incredible mercy and grace, extending a hand of strength to get them up again. It says in the book of Proverbs 24, verse 16, though a godly man falls seven times, they will get back up again. See, faith makes us get back up. Because when you're down in the dirt and nothing's working for you, you have no strength and no ability, something within us says, it's like a father speaking to his son, get up, son. Get up, daughter. This will not be the defining moment. Get up on your feet. Faith gives us strength. Strength that isn't human. Strength that isn't self-taught. Strength that doesn't come from a, you know, some kind of self-help book. It's a spiritual strength that comes within us by virtue of a relationship with the God who created. That's why God is described so often as Father. Because when my kids, and I have four of them, which means I have lots of them, so I have a little bit of a authority in this, this area. When my kids follow, which they often do, and I come along as a father, I don't run over and go, oh my gosh, you're falling, oh my gosh, are you okay? I, I, I go over and I say, son, are you okay? And very often, if it's a bad fall, I get down on one knee. And I'll pick him up and I'll give him a hug. And I'll say, the pain is gone now. You can get back up again. Amen. See, we think God is going to judge us and laugh at us and beat us up. No, God is a father and he loves us. 
Maybe one of you right now, someone in this room or watching online, your face is on the ground. You're thinking, man, how could God ever love someone like me? And your father says gently to you, my son, my daughter, I love you. Get back up again. Stay in the fight. This is not the end. The fourth thing you know is this. Remember that God can use your failure. Now, it may not be good, and it may not be fun to fail, and none of us want to, 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 to leverage or, or, or to, um, you know, how would you describe it, glorify failure, but God can make good come from it. Somehow God in his mercy can make good come from it. One of my favorite verses, Romans 8.28 says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say, as I've often explained here, that all things that happen to us will be good, that in all things God will make things good. It says that in all things, good or bad, God is working for our good and for the good of the world. In other words, God doesn't cause bad things to happen, but God does cause good things to come from them. This is why, again, if you're watching online or in the room, and you're new to faith, and maybe you're skeptical or just trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing, there is an enemy. There is a devil. Now, it sounds like, oh my gosh, here we go. But it's true. And his, his desire is to destroy us because if you had an enemy that you hated and you couldn't get to him because he was stronger than you, you would go for the next vulnerable point in his armor. Well, guess what the vulnerable point in God's armor is? His children. All seven billion of them. You see? And because the enemy can't get to God, he goes for his kids, destroying marriages, destroying lives, destroying societies, destroying nations. People often ask me as a pastor, if God were real, why is there all this evil and suffering in the world? And I say, well, number one, I say, well, if God is not real, then how do we answer that question without God? Who are we going to blame? If you're right as a non-believer and God is not real, then explain human suffering to me without God in the background. Because you know the answer lies? We're the problem. God, the reason people starve in Africa isn't because of God. It's because of human beings. There's more food in this nation to feed all the world than we even need right now. How often in a restaurant or at an evening meal do you toss out food? We have so much money. We have so much stuff. Usually our mental health and our, and our personal happiness is determined by how much stuff we have or don't have. When right now people in our world are fighting for their lives. And we ask the question, like, like we are, like, like Western people, like, where's God in all this? Hey, God has given you everything you need to change this world. Amen. Who's with me? Who's with me? It's really easy to brush it off in a conversation, but if you want to do something about it, we can do something about it. But the reason why evil exists is not because of God does or doesn't. It's because there is an enemy who is literally hell-bent, excuse the pun, on destroying humanity. And the good news is this, that even though bad things happen to us and to the world, God is always working in the background for our good. And every single person I know and every story I've ever heard of a person of faith and the relationship with God will say, there's been trials and there's been tribulations and there's been tough time, but I've never seen God forsake the righteous. Hallelujah. Not once, not ever, and he's not going to start with you. So four things we remember, just uh, shift gear and turn a corner real quick. Four things and response that we need to do. So that we know this, what do we need to do? Number one, refuse to compare. I'm not against wearing nice clothes. I don't do, I don't do the best job of myself, I'm quite simplistic. But I'm not against it. I'm not against social media, I'm honest. I'm not against any of these things. But if we're using these things to figure out who am I and what is my self-worth in relation to that person because they have a blue mark and 10 million followers and drive a Lamborghini, man, that is screwed up. We should take our sense of worth from God or from those who are closest, who love us, who say, a father, mother, brother, sister, I love you the way you are. Not from Instagram. Come on. What you get in your leaving cert will not define your future. Your career and how much you earn, what you work, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't decide who you are. You are a person. And what you do comes from who you are. We need to stop comparing ourselves. Why? Because it's not wise. And it's not fun. 
And it's not good. It's what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, we dare not to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves, sound familiar? And compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Which is why, surprise, surprise, when we follow these people who are stars, their lives are a disaster. And when they go out in the street, they don't want people following them. You ever watch a famous person try to go for a coffee? Because they realize that when on the red carpet, dressed up to the nines, the best verse, oh yes, take the photos. But when I'm really me, wanting to go for a coffee, I don't want the cameras and the fame. Because if you see who I really am, and if you knew the real background, so you couldn't follow or love me. It's why it's not wise. Because no matter how much money, wealth, fame, followers we have, we're all the same. We're all ordinary people broken and in need of a gospel. So if it's not wise to compare, then what is the wise question? What is the wise question? We're scrolling through Instagram, we're, we're going to a nice event, we're looking at someone get promoted and work. What is the wise question? The wise question, if you're a Christ follower, is simply this. Am I becoming more like Jesus today? The only person we're supposed to compare ourselves to is the Son of God in the flesh. Because it's when we become more like Jesus that we become better, our lives become better, and the world becomes better. Because when we're like Jesus, we're less judgmental. You can't follow Jesus and be a racist. You can't follow Jesus and not be generous. You can't follow Jesus and not show mercy and grace. You can't follow Jesus and not be patient. You can't follow Jesus and be a misogynist. You can't follow Jesus and sleep in peace knowing the world is dying of starvation. You can't do that. Why? Because the heart of God is humanity. And following Jesus means we're following him on mission to love, to protect, to speak up for those who have no voice, to show the world love in a divided world so full of tension and hatred and division. The love of Jesus unites. It doesn't mean everyone has to agree with what we say because they don't. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. But we ask the question, am I becoming more like Jesus today? The first thing we can do is refuse to compare ourselves to the world. The second thing we can do is this. Redefine the meaning of failure. Because fear, as I mentioned already alluded to, makes failure final. Oh my gosh, if I step out and do this thing and it fails, that's it forever. If I fail my driving test once, that's it for the rest of my life. If I don't do well in this exam, if I don't do well in this relationship, fear makes failure final. But faith makes failure useful. Faith says, God's not going to de- reject me because I screw up. God's not going to abandon me just because I didn't meet the cultural mark. God is going to somehow work for my good in this failure. See, all of us have failures. And it's true. Our failure may explain how we got here. Oftentimes, when someone says, tell me your story, we talk about the failures around our lives that shaped our lives, right? Whether it was our personal failures or our parents' failure or just economic failure, there's always a story, right? And it's true. Failure may explain how we got here, but failure does not need to determine who we are. And failure doesn't get to dictate how far we can go. Someone else does that. Failure is useful because it explains our story, but failure does not determine our identity, our value, and our worth. It's why in John 21, verse 7, my favorite stories, this is after Jesus had risen from the dead. If you remember, if you know the Bible story, if not, I'll explain to you. The apostle Peter, who was like Jesus' right-hand man, when Jesus was arrested, and Jesus like most most needy hour when when all of Jesus disciples abandoned him he was been falsely tried he was been falsely accused and he was falsely murdered for a crime he never committed and he felt abandoned by all his friends Simon Peter his right hand man denied even knowing him three times how many of you have ever had a friend like that you know what I'm saying like the, just the greatest moment not only was he not there he denied even knowing him Fast forward the clock, Jesus raised him dead, and we're told the disciples are out fishing, which is funny because they've gone back to what they know. They failed, they couldn't cut it, they didn't meet the mark of what they thought following Jesus meant, and so they went back to what they knew. Okay, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John, who wrote the Gospel of John, said to Peter, because they were looking, looking, looking over the beach and saw a man with a fire, It's the Lord! And you think the Simon Peter would go, oh my gosh, I'm such a disaster, I'm a failure, I, 
uh, well, I'm going to turn my back or I'll be last. About No, no. We're told that as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. In other words, to put it in the vernacular, he tore off all his clothes, didn't wait for the boat to arrive, dove in the water and started swimming towards Jesus. Swimming towards Jesus. He's a failure, right? He's betrayed him, right? What, what was it about Jesus that Peter knew, despite the, the most significant failure of my life, if I can just get back to him, if I can just get close to him, if I can just cover this ground, I don't need to wait for the boat, I don't need to wait for everyone else, I just need to be near Jesus. See, the reason why Peter was a quote-unquote success wasn't because he didn't fall, it's because he fell towards Jesus. He was cl- a classic example of someone who constantly screwed up, but he always chose to fall towards Jesus. We all fall. We're all going to fall. Some of us are falling right now. My question to you is, do you fall away from Jesus? Or do you fall towards Jesus? Do you go, man, I can't read my Bible today. I've, I've, just, I've not been good this week. I can't, I can't worship God today. I haven't been good this week. I can't. You know, do, we, do we fall away from him? Do we go, you know, I, I need to get in church, man. I need to get in his word. I need to get in my, I need to get back to Jesus because whoever I am and whatever I'm going to do and whatever I'm going to be, it's going to be with Jesus and not without him. So understand that we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to fall towards and not away from Jesus. Third one is this, we need to refocus on God. Refocus on God. God God's love for us, as I've alluded to today, is not based on our performance, but God's love for us is based on our person. God's love for you is not based on your ability to act. It's based on who you are. I know, right? It's crazy. It's crazy because you hear that and you think in the room or online, how could anyone, anyone really love me for who I am? Come on. You, 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 you notice, even your own family probably couldn't love you fully for who you are. All of us have to turn on a little bit of a, a performance to be accepted in society. God is the only person in this world who sees you with nothing on. And I don't mean clothes, you can see that too. But I mean in terms of the act, the facade, the mask. And loves you the way you are. And listen carefully, if you're a non-believer, or a skeptic person, or some another religious faith, you're thinking, you know, all all you want to get me to do is believe. That's true. That's 100%. That's my bias. So in case you're wondering, yes, I want you to 100% give your life to Jesus. That's out there now. But even if you don't, God still loves you. And God will not reject you. And God still wants to have a place in your life. Because we're not loved for what we do, we're loved for who we are. Now God wants to do some great things, but what we do from God's plan flows from who we are. It's why Paul said in Romans 5 verse 6 to 8, he said, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, we had no money, no fame, no glory, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly die. In other words, very rarely will anyone die for the neighbor who was just, just righteous and loved God and served him. But for a famous person or a noble person, we might possibly even dare to die. But God demonstrates. God illustrates. God proves. God put his money where his mouth was. God showed us the fact of his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait till we were righteous. Christ, so many people said to me, oh, I can't come to church. I can't, I can't follow God because, because I'm just I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a good person. Like one day when I get good, then God. No, no, no. While we we're still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God doesn't wait for us. God loves us the way we are. He's already paid the price for us to come before him and be in relationship with him. And our worth is not determined by what we do but who we are in his eyes. The fourth and final one is this, is that we should replace our fear. Replace it what? Replace it with faith. We should replace our fear. Why? Because we all need to face the fear of failure. You can't go on in life hiding under your blanket eating ice cream. It's okay for a day or two, but someone's got to pay some bills, right? People are going to come looking for you if you don't start answering text messages after three or four days. At some point, we need to face the fear of failure. And what I want you to see today is that we all have a choice to lean into faith when fear arises. And the reason why I think we should do this is because faith in Jesus never fails us. Faith in Jesus will never fail us. Jesus never failed anyone. 
and he's not going to start with you. Whenever fear arises and we feel paralyzed by it, we don't dismiss it because it's real. But rather we replace, okay, I feel that, I feel all the tension of the emotion of fear, but I'm going to not focus on, I'm not going to lean towards the pessimistic side, the humanistic side, I'm going to lean towards the faith side. I'm going to lean towards, man, God loves me, and God is for me, and God is working this somehow, and I can't see it, I don't understand it right now, but I trust in his goodness. I trust in his person. I trust that he will not fail me. It's why in Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. See, faith and trust isn't, isn't just a, an act or an event. It's a journey. It's a relationship. 